My name is Tammy Wincup and I'm the president of Protocol. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation on the evolution of cybersecurity. During one of Protocol's first virtual events back when the world first moved to work from home, we focused on cybersecurity. Our attempt to ensure that in the madness of keeping businesses running, that this important topic wasn't forgotten. At the time, I was amazed at the number of executives from across all industries who nodded their heads in agreement on the importance of the topic and then quietly shared with me that they needed a whole new game plan. Fast forward six months, we at Protocol wanted to return to this topic and ask what has changed? Are we as organizations, both public and private sector getting it right? In a few minutes, Protocol's senior reporter, Tom Krasett, and associate editor, Kevin McAllister, will lead a great editorial discussion on the future of cybersecurity. But to help us set the stage, we are so pleased to be partnering with Ubico to make this conversation possible. Specifically, I'm pleased to have Jared Chong with us. Jared is the Chief Solutions Officer at Ubico, where he focuses on evolving identity and authentication solutions. Jared has more than 20 years of IT security experience specializing in architecting, deploying, and supporting enterprise solutions. Hi, Jared. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Delighted to be here. You know, when we were chatting, I was thinking about, um, you know, maybe having you help us set the stage. You know, six months into an entirely new work environment, paint the picture for us. What types of breaches are you seeing now that potentially we weren't seeing in the past? Well, to be honest, everything is is uh, is elevated. So all attacks are, are happening uh, on the rise. And there's one particular type of attack I think that's uh, very relevant to other times, which is um, it's very low cost and it's very effective. Uh, and that's credential theft. And the number one attack that we see 
you know, by far has the most impact on organizations is, is credential phishing. Uh, and when you have credential phishing, you essentially can do account takeover. And when you do account takeover, essentially you can do whatever you want, uh, pretending to be someone else, uh, whether it's for uh, financial gain or political um, gain or for anything else, essentially. And, you know, this particular type of attack, credential phishing, is very relevant for us as humans because it really capitalizes on our emotions. And it's really easy to um, deceive or to manipulate our feelings and emotions on a day-to-day -day basis, given you know, what's happening around us. So it's, it's highly effective and uh, attackers know this. And, and at the same time, it's actually really low cost for, for most uh, um, uh, threat actors. Hmm. So, you know, we're, you're seeing these types of attacks again, more than ever. Talk to us about what you've seen in the last six months. You know, I know that you personally and Yubico are, are, you know, a really advocate for strong authentication, making it simple, secure, and scalable. Can you give us some examples of how you're seeing organizations take the first necessary steps and what those steps are? Yes, yeah, so I strongly believe that, you know, we have to make, um, a, really a dent in this industry on, on having our users being fished um, all the time. And when we talk about strong authentication, what we really mean here is, you know, it has, it has to withstand phishing attacks. And it's a very basic thing, which is if you can trick a user to uh, give their username and password, so they can trick your users to review an OTP code, mm -hmm. uh, that's not good enough today. I think that, that those, the number of attacks that we've seen across the board uh, are using these techniques that, that just trick the user to give out information. So when we talk about technology that is secure, we have to think about uh, very phishing resistant technology. And the second thing that's really important is that we can't have IT fight with security, right? Like I want it secure, I want it easy to use. Like we can't have this conversation anymore. It's gotta be easy to use and secure. And, and that's where I think uh, it, takes, it, it takes a different type of approach to solve this problem. And, and the way that I think we have to solve this approach is to use open standards. And, and the reason why we say that is that back in 2014, um, we worked with uh, the Google team to create this universal second factor, which is a really a, a, a huge leap in the way that we look at security and usability and also uh, phishing resistant. And then fast forward to two, three years ago, we worked with um, actually the Microsoft team, Joyce here, you know, to, to then take that to what we call FIDO2. And now it's really a, sta a web standard, web authentication standard that everyone can implement. So when we talk about scale, we needed to have it natively supported in, in you know, sort of the gateways to what we do on an online, which is using a browser, using a computer. Those have to be default. Um, and we want to help bring everybody into this journey where you can get strong authentication is really easy to use and honestly is ubiquitous because it's nearly supported in the modern operating systems that we have mm -hmm. uh, specifically i think you know one of the things that when it's very impactful to to discuss is what what is the outcome of implementing such a uh, technology or standard um Google actually did a case study on this and, and achieved zero account takeovers, right? And, but not just that. I think the interesting thing is that it also reduces the support cost. Uh, it was a significant amount of support cost uh, over 90% because it's just easier to manage and, and, and use as well, but also increased productivity, right? So you must achieve security, uh, reduce the cost because you, ha you have less password resets. And, and because it's easy, you increase productivity. So I think the next wave of technology implementation has to address this all at the same time. We can't, we can't just choose security over other things that matters to business. They all need to go hand in hand. And so when you talk about that study of them having zero breaches, what was it that they actually implemented? Was it a multi-factor authentication or, you know, what, what, you know, as, as executives here and operators are thinking about kind of necessary first steps, like, was it that as the first step that, that, that proved it or, or was it a series of different things that they were working on? I think there are, there are a series of different things, but you know, if we look at that, you know, credential thefts and the first thing that you do is that if you don't have even, a, you don't have two-factor authentication, you're already behind the curve. Uh, Google in specific case, you know, when we work with them, uh, we created the open standard. It's called uh, U2F, universal second factor. So user, universal second factor was the, was the genesis of now what we call web authentication. 
so it's an open standard now. Uh, back then, it wasn't really an open standard, but you know, obviously, we want to evolve the composition so that organizations can actually benefit. So it is implementing a new technology stack, which is now a standard that really prevents uh, credential phishing because it's highly phishing resistant, because it's really easy to use. And by the way, it actually saves you money along the way as well. So Google has implemented this technology pretty much uh, internally. Uh, everybody's using this technology and the standard uh, and it's also extend to their partner network. So it shouldn't just stop with employees of an organization. They should extend to their partner network and ultimately it should extend to customers. Customers, customers are important as well. Uh, let's back up because I think that, you know, one of the pieces that we've heard of is, you know, I, is the identity management and the culture of kind of thinking about identity management. Have you seen it particularly in the last six months that, you know, when Ubico is coming to these organizations, that many of them that have kind of an old school identity management mindset as well as architecture have to actually tackle that first before they are able to do these other things? Or are you seeing that as being less common? I think IEM solutions in general um, have to evolve because the threat landscape has evolved. So we can't uh, we can't assume that the techniques used, you know, even three four years ago, uh, are the same, right? I mean, they, I think that there, there is a need to put something in place. Uh, don't get me wrong, but I think we it's a it's a journey that everybody's got to say what's next because. You know, just saying that I've got my, you know, let's say my single sign-on solution done, I'm, I'm, I'm okay now, right? Or I've made a, my password policy much longer <laughs> or more frequent. It, like those conversations need to evolve, which is like, is the, are we using the right stack? But more importantly, I think um, organizations need to ask themselves the question, what, what is my technology provider giving me to move the needle? Right, so I think we should expect more from technology vendors to not just be status quo. They need to do more, given what the threats are. And most organizations actually know this, uh, and most technology companies actually know this. So we should expect more. And I can give a kind of a simple example, which is like Google. After we work with Google, Google made this technology available to to their Gmail platform. So all everybody in you know using Gmail today can actually benefit from this. Uh, new protocol, web authentication, uh, FIDO authentication within using Gmail. And so you start to ask your question, so is my, now my Gmail account seemingly is more secure than my bank, logging into my bank account. So that's a problem. Like I would want my bank account to be as secure, if not more secure than my, my email accounts. So we have to, we have to work together, uh, all, all, all of us, uh, industry and um, and our users to say that we need this change now. We can't, we can't be waiting another 10 years for everybody right. to adapt, adopt a better technology. One quick question before we turn it over to our colleagues here. I know that you and uh, are pretty passionate about the idea of identity security, not just for organizations, but also you know, really at-risk individuals and vulnerable communities. Will you just put a fine point and end us with, what, what does that look like right now? And, and quickly, what could we be doing to help in terms of that? Yes, this is a very dear topic to, to me and, and everyone at Ubico. You know, as, as us professionals, you know, we have the resources and a lot of um, expertise to sort of protect ourselves and our organization. Uh, but there are definitely a lot of people um, at the at-risk categories that don't have it. So one of our missions is obviously we need to make this available to everyone, like strong authentication and easy to use authentication should be a right, not, not a privilege. Um, Recently, we actually launched uh, Ubico for free speech program where we, um, we actually give away one YubiKey to a journalist or a vulnerable population for every 20 YubiKeys that we sell at the web store. So at Ubico, we produce a hardware authenticator really encompassing inside a, um, uh, all, the, all the cryptography inside and easy to use. This is an example of a, of a YubiKey that has a I, iPhone um, a lightning connector and USB-C. So we want to empower these individuals really so that they can stay safe. Um, a lot of them are trying to protect the democracy. Uh, they are trying to write about social injustice and they're trying to create freedom uh, for the world. And, and truly if we, if we can't have an open free internet. We really can't be doing what we're doing today. So um, all of us, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be silent about it and we should help those that have been silenced. Jared, my thanks to you and to Yubico for setting the stage for us, for your experience on this topic. Um, 
And I'll, we'll turn it over to Tom Krausett now to continue the conversation on the future of cybersecurity. Thanks again, Jared. Thanks, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the second part of our discussion here. Uh, my name is Tom Kraz, and I'm a senior reporter with Protocol. And in just a second, I'll be joined by the rest of our panel, including Kevin McAllister, associate editor of Protocol and in charge of our Brain Trust uh, operation, which you should check out. Uh, we also have today uh, Mike Hamilton, uh, founder and chief information security officer at CI Security, uh, Good security morning. Monitoring and response services provider. Uh, Danny Allen, who is Chief Technology Officer at Veeam, which provides backup and disaster recovery software. And Joy Chick, who is a Corporate Vice President of Microsoft, and they do a little bit of everything. Uh, so I wanted to start off with expanding on the point that, that Jared and Tammy were just talking about, you know, with respect to how a lot of assumptions around security, around work in general this year have changed, and, and a lot of the ways that the company's thinking about securing their uh, employees has, has had to change along with it. Um, so I wanted to ask all of you, you know, what you've seen in terms of how security professionals are managing this abrupt shift to working from home, something that will, will probably be, you know, in a hybrid fashion, the way that we work for the foreseeable future. Um, and, you know, also to build on the, the notion of credential hijacking as one of the primary vectors into um, into these into these workplaces today. So I'm not sure who's best to start. Um, so I'll let you fight it out. Uh, I'll start. Um, so first of all, um, those were great opening comments, uh, Jared. And um, uh, your CISO is uh, Chad Thunberg, who's a r great old friend of mine. Please tell him I said hi. Um, 100% spot on with the, um, the emphasis on credential theft. Microsoft has got some really interesting data that they've shown. Um, they know when there's a link in your email that points to a, a site that looks like Microsoft or SharePoint or something like that and is asking for credentials. And so they've mapped the rise in those phishing sites versus the drop in sites that push malware on you. And it is striking to see how things have shifted. And it's because exactly what Jared says, if, if I can get you to give, give me your password, I'm just going to walk into your network and plant bombs. I don't have to package some exotic exploit and get you to bite on it. You know, it just, it, it makes it too easy. So clearly that's what's happening. And I think that the, um, you know, the, the, the COVID uh, uh, redesign of all the way we have to do our networks now, because we have a big distributed workforce instead of a centralized workforce, there's a much greater emphasis on multi-factor authentication and um, uh, endpoint security, right? You're not all in a building where we can monitor your traffic easily. Now we have to grab it from out there and bring it in and analyze that. So, uh, you know, I think that, that COVID is going to force us into really, really thinking hard about zero trust and how we enable a mobile workforce um, and going forward in the future. Uh, I, th I think this is actually going to be a good transition. I think this is going to be good for us. Yeah, let me add on to what Michael just actually said. I mean, completely we see that from Microsoft with like 200,000 customers we serve. As COVID hit, you know, uh, beginning of when, you know, a lot of our customer myself, we go from, you know, mostly just going to, uh, um, you know, our campus, your, uh, you know, the, the company corporate sort of uh, environment to do our work to you go flip almost 100%, especially in the tech industry, 100%, right? You know, typically we don't do things from zero to 100 in overnight. And that's exactly what happened. And what we see is Microsoft and a lot of our uh, customers who have embraced uh, zero trust, uh, you know, you know, like years ago or, or just in the in the last 12, 18 months, they have much easier uh, 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 ways to help the um, employees and their end users to be productive and secure. 
and uh, you know an example like Bridgewater because they've been working with us on uh, you know how do we always uh, you know make sure we don't have the, the the corporate network as a perimeter how do you think about to uh, use you know identity use uh, endpoint I think Michael also pointed that out and think about uh, so user devices the application and application at this point it's a both on-premise applications as well as SaaS applications and uh, and how do you secure data so really kind of um, using zero trust as a set of principle, like you always assume breach, you don't, you use identity driven and the endpoint driven as a security, uh, the new perimeter versus the traditional sort of the VPNs and network. And, uh, you know, that's make, you know, customers and their users to go back to 100% productive right away. And then on the point about in terms of multi-factor authentication and a 2FA, you know, I always like to talk in many of the different conferences. It's almost like 2FA is great, except if you're not thinking about, you know, the end user experience and make it a secure and a frictionless, what you end up doing just training your end users to basically accept that 2FA proof every single time. So you end up with, you know, making it easier for attackers to basically fission of any of the, even you have 2FA um, enabled. And that's why we emphasize this, uh, you know, using 2FA, but using better authentication, like, you know, we partner closely with Ubico uh, using methods like a passwordless authentication based on FIDO 2.0, which is industry standards. For me personally, you know, being working from home, you know, I'm using Windows Hello as a way to just, you know, use my uh, um, uh, passwordless authentication. I, I honestly don't remember my passwords at this point. Um, and that's all, not only making the user experience better, but uh, frankly, you know, because the password is cumbersome and it's a, a complex, and even with complex password, people forget, it also reduces the IT cost. Microsoft alone, you know, we see just, uh, you know, with self-service uh, password reset using Windows Hello, we actually reduced the IT cost by 80% or so in this area alone, uh, which is a phenomenon. You're talking about uh, really just from hard cost to soft cost, uh, plus like almost, uh, you know, like uh, um, uh, $10 million uh, um, together. And that's really, really significant uh, for, uh, you know, not just Microsoft, but for all our customers. The last point I would just add is, uh, as COVID hit, you know, I think we usually think a customer is going to take a huge, like a multi-year journey to, you know, go to zero trust approach. But we just had, you know, Microsoft Ignite and we announced some of the phenomena just, you know, when customers are really driven by the sort of the, the, the critical need. Like Durham University, you know, we, like I think over three weeks, we flipped them from on-premise to the cloud you know, for over 18,000 students. And the United Arab uh, of Emirates, we have over like a span of four weeks, they have put their entire school system online, which is over 350,000 students. So what I'm gonna to call to action is that this can be done. It is important that, you know, the, the, the COVID or just a hybrid work environment is not going away. So be able to take the zero trust approach and a turn on MFA and also using like a, you know, conditional access or these risk-based smart intelligent um, uh, two-factor authentication uh, use the passwordless is super, super critical to balance security and the productivity. Yeah, I would just echo what has been said already. We often look at these events like the pandemic as being challenges, but I actually think it's opportunities. It was Satya Nadella, I think, who said, you know, in two months, we've progressed more than two years. And what has really emerged from this, we always said the network, you know, the network is dead. We need zero trust and defend the application and tighten the perimeter to the data center. But we didn't really do it, especially around authentication. We we consider multi-factor authentication in some respects, many organizations to be something you know, but then where you are, which is not one of the factors. It's something you know, something you have, something you do, something you are. And so one of the things that this has done, and I think it's fantastic for the industry, is it's forced us, because of a remote work environment, it's forced us to actually implement 
multi-factor authentication more securely and it will into the future. So I believe that this is very good for the industry that, that we're considering now remote individuals coming in from anywhere. And one of the reasons I say that, we don't often think about this, we often think of the, the ecosystem in which we work as the employees at the organization. One of the things that we think about is the supply chain. We work with an awful lot of partners and sometimes we, we ignore their role in the products or the solutions that we're building. And so this forces us to think more carefully about things like perimeter security and multi-factor authentication and zero trust and all of this. So, I would argue that this is a fantastic thing for the industry to improve our, our security posture. Danny, I want to kind of uh, jump off, off that answer there because you've described some of the, the inflection points that I think the cybersecurity industry has, has approached with the um, increased acceleration, certainly as, as COVID has, has adjusted the way that enterprises are actually functioning. But, but how do you actually communicate that and match that up with the inflection points on the enterprise side itself, how do you communicate to um, the, the CEO as an as an outside vendor to say, you know, this is something that you really need to be paying attention to, uh, especially you know as as you're figuring out your budget for 2021, um, if this does eventually go on for for longer than you know even we may think right now. Well, I'm certainly interested in what Michael and Joy have to say on this, but two things I would say for us: one is. We align it to business value because often we think of security as a, as a cost to the business. And I think one of the things I really appreciated about the earlier comments is we aligned it to business value. How do we make this consumer simple? Often our, our brains, at least in the security industry, is how do we make it secure, secure, secure? We should actually pivot in our thinking to how can we make this better for the end user and look at the competitive advantages that come from aligning this. So certainly one of the factors that we look at um, is the, the business value that we're bringing to the organization. And then secondly, just how do we align with our strategic ob objectives? One of the things that, that has certainly been the case because of the pandemic and the implementations that we've been taking is it's helped accelerate our adoption of some of cloud, uh, a cloud strategy that was already in place. So we try to align it to existing uh, objectives that are inside the business. But I'm interested in what Michael and Joy might have to say. Um, so this is, this is actually, so thanks for queuing me up, Danny. Uh, I, <laughs> I agree with you. Um, I will say that when, so the nature of the conversation has really changed. I mean, as you point out, you know, this is not keep the bad guys out of the network anymore. This is manage the risk of a foreseeable event. And so when I am speaking with executives, decision makers, elected officials, senators, governors, um, you, you can't talk about scary cyber Russian buffer overflow SQL injection stuff. It's just not going to work. Um, so the way to have that conversation in my view and what I found to be successful is you talk about the outcomes that you really want to avoid from a business perspective and cyber, cyber, cyber aside, you know, you can, you can fairly group things in just a few buckets. So, you know, number one is unauthorized disclosure of records, you know, the dreaded records breach that everyone thinks is the worst thing in the world. It's not. Um, the second one is theft and extortion, right? Extortion. We say ransomware because in our business, we have weird names for stuff. It's, it's disruption for the purpose of extortion. And then the third one is just disruption for the purpose of disruption, which is starting to happen more and more frequently, especially in things like operational technology, industrial control systems. So if you think about those three things, records disclosure, theft and extortion, service disruption, you can figure out a cost for every one of those. So, you know, Larry Poneman, he was the president of Gardent, which was a startup I worked at a long time ago, and now he's the Poneman Institute. And he has, you know, reasonably good numbers on what it costs to recover from a records breach. So, you know, if you're in the private sector, it's going to be somewhere around $150 a record that goes all the way to the health sector where it's more like $400 a record. Okay, so call it 100 bucks just for easy math, right? So if you have a million records, um, that meet the definition of personally identifiable information or some other kind of regulated data, right? Uh, and they're worth a uh, hundred bucks a piece. You have a potential of a hundred million dollars in liability there. If you've done your risk assessment and you think you're at about 30% risk, okay, you have a $30 million potential liability. Can I have $50,000 to spend on controls to cut that risk in half? 
well, if you get $15 million in risk reduction for an, you know, cost of $50,000, that's probably a conversation you can have. So thinking about the real outcomes to avoid that would have the business impact, you know, setting aside viruses and cyber and all of that stuff, you know, I, I found focusing on these things and assigning costs to them is a much better way to have a conversation. Uh, the other thing I'll say is, you know, since this is risk management um, and, you know, not so much, you know, build a shell around us so nobody gets in, um, there's two terms to the risk expression. There's the likelihood of a bad event, records disclosure, theft and extortion, service disruption, and there's the impact of that event, 100 bucks a record, okay? So the way that we buy down the, 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 the likelihood of a bad event is we invest in preventive controls. Everybody has done that this whole time. And so everybody's got firewalls, antivirus, email security, URL filtering, IPS, right? All of this stuff. Um, but you will never buy that likelihood down to zero. So then you work with the impact term. And the way that you buy down risk focusing on impact is through detection and effective response. If you can put out a little fire right away, because little fires are going to start, you will never get a call from the FBI 200 days later saying all your records are for sale on the dark market. Um, you know, there's a company going through this right now. You know, speaking of multi-factor authentication, um, Tyler Technologies right now is number one service provider to all the local governments in the United States. One of their products is uh, election reporting software. They do not use multi-factor authentication to log into government systems that they help manage. So they are now down. We don't know what happened. It's possible credentials have been lifted. And since there's no multi-factor authentication there, it's likely, you know, some friends in Uzbekistan are tromping through counties right now, getting ready to lay bombs for elections. So, you know, the, we have to manage risk like that. So everybody's out looking at logs right now to try and detect whether or not there's something in there before it actually goes off. So to drive that home, right, there's, a, there's an example right there that's very current. I would just uh, add, agree with uh, uh, what Danny and Michael said, and I there's just add a couple points. Um, one is, I think, uh, you know, both pointed, I think uh, we want, I think you need to make sure, especially with now we're in recession, I think I know all companies, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, the management are very, uh, in terms of laser focused on what's the cost and how to drive down cost. And there's actually a lot of studies, uh, you know, from in terms of, you know, Forrester, we recently partnered with Forrester on the study is uh, just using, you know, identity uh, access management solutions like Azure AD by itself will really can just uh, uh, help you to return on investment for over 123%. Uh, and that's in just six months. So I think that there's a way to really articulate uh, uh, just the cost benefit, not only just the security part of it. And the other part of what, you know, even Microsoft we see is, uh, you know, security needs to be, now it is becoming a boardroom conversation. It's not just about the IT conversation because, uh, you know, in the past we just say, hey, you know, how do you make your employees secure? How do you secure your assets? Sort of it's more of a risk management. But now we really see, you know, when security breach happens, not only business is impacted, the productivity is impacted. Often it really, really just damage, frankly, some often destroy the, the brand, the trust of a company. And so this becomes the probably number one topic in many of the, the board meetings, including Microsoft board meetings in terms of how do we protect Microsoft and how do we protect our customers? Uh, so I think we also kind of really advocate is uh, from security as a topic uh, that you need to elevate that into the boardroom agenda, not just uh, that remains as uh, sort of the IT or the CISO level in terms of agenda uh, within the operation side. Just building on Joy's point there, I, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that one other thing that I've heard a lot about as I've talked to people about how these practices are evolving is the need to make security not just the IT department, not just the boardroom level, but really an organizational value throughout, you know, top to bottom, through product development, through the way that people think about, you know, simply building all of their all of their products. Um, how can companies do that? What are effective ways that organizations can make security a core value 
um, you know, just as top of mind as anything else that's on their agenda. Well, One I of the things a... that we Go do, ahead, at least from a software perspective, is make it a culture of building it into the organization. In fact, I go back to the memo that Bill Gates sent out back in January of 2002. He said, we're gonna make our software secure. That top down communication, the, the clarity that it is important, that it is a fundamental principle of everything you do is, is so important. So one of the things that we do is, is that same approach, make sure that everyone is certainly aligned on it, but then commit to it from the top down of this is going to be a built-in principle of our organization. And when you do that, it, it fundamentally changes the culture. It's not about technology. We can, we can do lots of technology changes, but you have to make it part of the culture uh, when you're going through that. And one of the ways that we have found to be very effective beyond that is to take the choice away from the users when possible to, th to make things more secure. Michael mentioned uh, buffer overflows, for example. One of the ways that you can eliminate buffer overflows is to do black box analysis or source code analysis, many ways to do it. But the most effective thing that we've done in the last 20 years is introduce the .NET framework or Java frameworks that eliminate buffer overflows entirely. So if you can build in the controls that it's not even an option to do something insecurely, you're likely to end up further ahead than you would be if you introduced something independent by itself. Yeah, I'll just quickly just build on what Danny said it completely. As we thinking, like we thinking about security is for everyone, right? So one is the end users, you know, how do we get end users the best experience so that uh, they don't just uh, put uh, like uh, your password on a sticky note on your, you know, stick on your computer so everybody can just, uh, you know, say, oh, that's your password. Um, and uh, I mean, again, goes back to the passwordless, uh, the at FIDO, the, the 2FA is just how to make it, you know, again, we stress the security and the, the uh, seamless experience so that uh, everybody can be secure, but also just uh, be, you know, be just integrated into the end user experience uh, seamlessly. One of the things from the end user perspective also, you know, one of the things we uh, we have done recently um, is, uh, you know, end user, we actually done that in our consumer product, but now we introduce in the enterprise side as well, which is, uh, you know, end users can go into their signing uh, portal about their signing activities. We have all the machine learnings and uh, the um, uh, security knobs on the IT side, but we also have, a, you know, end users to, you know, have a way so they can see their signing activities and for the ones that actually say oh wow i think we might have uh, lost joy there um, who would have thought microsoft would drop out on the bandwidth <laughs> um so i'm gonna i'm gonna take this uh, this up. looks suspicious uh, uh, signing so that happens to me and uh, the the last thing i would also say is um that, you know, it is absolutely not just the end user, but also the whole DevOps, right? How do you secure the entire DevOps? You know, Danny talked about the code, you know, how can we make code that doesn't, you know, just itself is, you know, you cannot have security vulnerability, but how can you do continue to in the CI CD pipeline, because this can happen in the deployment, something can be injected. So how can you continue in the CI CD pipeline? Like we're doing a lot of work in Git with GitHub, for example, is how do you really have that secure the supply chain, not just supply chain for hardware, but supply chain from the code and the productivity uh, of when the actual, you know, the software is gets generated and get deployed into our life sites. So, so I'm going to partially agree and then I'm going to strongly disagree with something. So I, you know, building it in from the beginning, um, you know, working with DevOps and using, you know, development frameworks that, you know, prevent you from making a coding mistake that would end up in, you know, the ability to inject code into the running part of the stack, blah, blah, blah. Um, that was really great idea. Uh, but I have heard this talk about a culture of security for a long time. Okay. Now, 30% of Americans right now will believe anything that's hung in front of them if it confirms their pre-existing beliefs. Okay, you want to trust those people? You're going to trust those people to always make the right decision? No, there is not now and there never will be a firewall for stupid. So 
in the uh, uh, spirit of making things impossible, we've had this policy that is ridiculous for a long time, and it's called de minimis use. And what it means is you can use the company, the government's, your organization's technology for your personal use, as long as it doesn't create a security problem, cost extra money, or affect your productivity. And I prove it does all three. Um, when I was the chief of information security for the city of Seattle, we made lots and lots of measurements and we monitored the heck out of that network. And I could prove at the time that 40% of the compromised assets in that network came from the use of personal email. Okay, so you're looking at a screen and here's Outlook and we pay a lot of money to clean it up and Microsoft does a great job and right next to it, there's a web browser open to Bubba's email service or, or, or whatever. And with all of this junk coming in with absolutely no controls on it. So if we would rescind the policy of de minimis use and make it impossible for somebody to sit there and be Facebook and around on a company computer, a whole bunch of, and especially if you couple that with multi-factor authentication and zero trust, a whole bunch of this problem just goes off a cliff. And so do these cheap things you know, rather than, you know, believing the venture capital community and you got to buy the next, you know, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence gizmo to solve all your problems. No, just start a policy. All personal use will be on a personal device. Whether or not you can technically enforce that, it's another issue. But a policy found in violation can result in a public hanging and that's a very effective control. So, you know, I, I am a curmudgeon, curmudgeon about this. I say, don't trust people, make it impossible for them to blow it because they're all trying to blow it. I, I, Michael, I don't think uh, there's uh, any disagreement. I think uh, it's the end, it's not the or. Basically, mm -hmm. I think the end is you do need all the security products and the policies so mm -hmm. that it you know, and I think we all agree. I think we all agree in terms of zero trust as a way you always assume breach. You, mm -hmm. you know, we all one click away from phishing attack. And I can swear, as much as you know, being a secure in the security space myself, sometimes, especially when we're busy, boy, it is so easy just to click on the link because you know, because it's a phishing attack, it's so easy and it's happened to be something like a very relevant to top of my mind. For example, like an ergonomic desk during the COVID time, you know? Um, so totally 100% agree in terms of how do we prevent those things. But I think uh, what, you know, earlier Danny and I talk about, I also think because of the attack, I think uh, Gerald uh, talked about earlier, I think we all see attack patterns uh, and the intensity and the nation state sponsored was becomes more and more heightened. So the question is uh, how can we, you know, protect, uh, you know, even from the beginning of before the software gets released, but by no means, uh, you know, I, I'm in identity space, like by no means, it's like the most easily attack pattern is still through, you know, credential theft. That is still the predominant over 80% of the attack pattern. So, so there's no mistake on that. It's more of like, we need to do more than that, right? And more than that is, you know, sort of how do we evolve in terms of, okay, when from the developer angle, how we think from the end user angle, the places so they can be more well educated. But last but not least, is we should always assume breach uh, because that's just going to happen no matter how educated we are. Can I ask all of you to expand on one thing that we kind of came up there, which is the zero trust model? And I think that a lot of we're hearing a lot about this more and more, I think, and I think a lot more companies are embracing this. I don't necessarily know if it is as well understood. Um, among uh, among the folks out there. So could you all kind of walk us through what you consider to be the zero trust model, what it enables, how it's implemented, and why it's so compelling? Sure, I'll go first because um, our, I think your other guests are going to know a lot more than me. So uh, in my view, this was pioneered by the financial industry and something called know your customer regulations that they had. And that's why when you were using originally a banking site, if your device had changed, if your location on earth has changed, if any of your other characteristics have changed, right? Strange thing, you're logging in a weird time of day, things like that, you would be challenged for an additional factor. And so now that's extended to zero trust. And as Joy says, we assume you got a dirty computer that you're trying to attach to the network. So, you know, looking at all of these attributes 
in uh, applying some statistical baselining, some artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera, to see if anything about you has changed. And if it has, you get hit with that additional factor. Um, this is also um, gone as far as, you know, policy checks before you're al allowed into the network, things like that. Yeah, the way I think about it is you don't trust any critical transaction. We've been talking a lot about multi-factor authentication. That's really, can the organization trust the individual on the other side of the network? Um, and so we ask them for something they know and something they have and they get in. But if you think of that as a banking site, after I log into that site, the question then is not, can the organization trust the user? Sometimes it's, can the user trust the organization, what they're seeing, for example? Um, there is a specific type of attack called cross-site request forgery, which essentially allows you to uh, instruct someone to do something on your behalf. So after I've logged into the, uh, into the application, multi-factor authentication doesn't do anything for me if the user says, clicks the button and says transfer funds from one account to another. So in, in sensitive transactions that occur, it may be that you don't want to trust that particular transaction. You say to me, well, well, how does that type of thing occur? Every single user out there who's using a browser, I shouldn't say every user, most users have extensions, for example, in the browser that have access to the DOM, the document object model of the browser, and can read everything that is taking place inside the browser. And so those are, that's an example that every time someone does something, you should validate that it's what they intended to do, and that instruction was carried out by that particular person. And we've been getting a lot better at this, I would say, as an industry, because we've been building our applications in, in microservice architecture that is that enables this type of thing to take place, but we still have to get even better, especially as we move more to DevOps and disaggregated architectures with components from multiple different locations. This is the type of activity that we want to validate every single time something of a sensitive nature takes place. Yeah, and uh, I would just say that the way we kind of, you know, really think about zero trust is really looking at, uh, you know, customers, their entire digital estate. So it starts with users, you have devices and all the applications, so whether they are on-premise applications or SaaS applications uh, and all the data they uh, they are accessing the networks environment, uh, uh, they are sort of the data centers, so if they have all their own data centers. So both the physical as well as the entities. So really looking at that entirety and the given now we are interconnected, whether you are you know, working from an untrusted network, whether you are you know, working from your personal device, whether you are trying to uh, using SaaS apps or whether it's on-premise apps, is uh, how do we really using, you know, we call our identity as the driven uh, for uh, a parameter uh, of identity plus endpoint driven parameter uh, to use, we actually have, we call the three principles uh, to, um, uh, to assume zero trust. One is, you know, I think a lot of talk about in this conversation is uh, how do you explicitly verify, you know, the user and uh, continuously verify so that whether it's a two factor authentication, as well as just a continuous uh, authenticator, even if it's service principles, uh, or like you have a IOT devices, so it's not limited just a user, it's to truly verify who you are. The second, obviously, we talked quite a bit also just assume breach, you know, you should always assume breach identity itself is only the front door is okay, if you uh, if you break in the front door, then what's the next la layer, you know, is the devices is it compliant, uh, or has been jailbroken or not, and is the application so how can you do continuous monitoring inside the applications. And last but not least, there's many more like how do you encrypt your sensitive data and only allow access with people who have the privilege uh, versus not. Um, so that's always assume breach and then use the different mechanism to protect at the end of the day, we're protecting the data and the applications the user access to. And the, the third principle is the least privileged access model. Is we often with our customers so give way too many admin uh, privileges, uh, uh, sometimes global admin privileges uh, um, uh, to many of the, the resources and assets. 
So really, how do you give the least amount of privilege with the shortest duration that just in time, the least amount of privilege? Because we should always just have knowing, you know, we have going to have the bridge. It's just a question is what is the, uh, the amount of, uh, uh, in terms of a uh, 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 span of, uh, in terms of the amount of uh, you know, different assets of, uh, of the environment that uh, be the, the hackers be able to pop, you know, propagate themselves into as well was what things has been really being leaked or being damaged. So if we can reduce this to the duration as well as the scope of the impact, and then the, the things to add on top of that is the continuous detection. So if you add that on top of that is you can quickly detect the end of the breach and be able to make the gate that quickly. Um, so that's kind of, we think about a holistically end to end of the zero trust concept. We've been we've been talking a lot of, about mitigating risk factors uh, externally. I'm curious if we can turn our our you know vision inward a little bit. We're, we're um, taking a question right now from the audience, and I encourage uh, others uh, watching to uh, submit yours. This one from from David Libby, who asks, "What kinds of consequences do you recommend employers enact if an employee accidentally or purposefully participates in an attack?" Well, those are those are two different things you know, accidentally is, is happening all around us all the time. I mean, you know, that's what we've been talking about it. As Joy said, it's really easy when you're in a hurry and crunched in meetings and something comes up that somehow got through that looks enticing and you're going to, you're going to bite on it. Um, so that one should be handled by, you know, normal HR procedures and your internal policy. Somebody that is intentionally doing it, somebody, an insider threat, and you've actually verified that, um, that's time for law enforcement. You know, there are, it's, it, and, and it's unfortunate that there is not really um, a great role for state or local law enforcement. Federal law enforcement is really the only law enforcement that gets involved here. That's starting to change a little bit, right? There's no cops you can call to say, one of my users is in collusion with somebody and has stole a bunch of, you know, stolen a bunch of intellectual property. Um, it is, uh, uh, you know, the Secret Service, the FBI, increasingly U.S. Marshals. Interestingly, ICE is doing a lot of investigations for things like this. Um, don't know how their mission got extended that way, but, you know, welcome to the club, guys. Um, so, you know, if somebody is doing something intentional and you can prove it, that is definitely the time for law enforcement. You know, again, if, you know, if somebody is, uh, you know, a high recidivism risk, um, you know, you need to take that through HR and, you know, uh, the words up to and including termination need to be real. And I would say on the software side, like, you know, more and more, so I think we focus a lot on the security in this conversation. I think the question actually kind of connect to the, the compliance and the monitoring side, because, you know, you more and more so we see you know data leakage as well inside uh, inside the risk uh, becomes the top of mind uh, for uh, uh, you know the at the CISO CIO uh, or CEO level so there's a lot of work uh, like we're doing in terms of you know before I would say hey like uh, we care more about uh, you know sort of fishing or sort of unauthenticated attack and all that but more and more so so you can easily you know an employee work for different you know they can work for different vendors or company what about the data leakage across the different enterprises so we have these conditional access policies you know on top of that that to apply so that you can don't have that cross sort of you know customer data leakage and the things like you know we talk about use of your personal device on one hand you know, a lot of times you want to make your user productive to allow personal device access to corporate data, but you can easily apply policies so that they cannot download or save copies of data uh, to their device. That doesn't mean it solves everything, but it's a way of layers of mitigation. And also monitoring and auditing is super important, right? Because you know, no matter what software employee easily can, I mean, at some point it will have ways uh, to work around it. So how can we continue to make sure we have all the auditing there and as, as, as well as just monitoring those auditing, audit, like audit logs on behavior. So to see if there's any suspicious patterns. But with all that said, it is also important to, to do these, uh, you know, 
sort of training in terms of uh, the employees should be very clear in terms of what's their roles and their uh, uh, responsibility uh, so that uh, um, so that they don't breach that, uh, you know, um, uh, the agreement with the enterprise they work for. Um, so. One of the areas that I'm interested in around this specifically is we've been doing monitoring at a network level, at an application level, behavioral level people. Um, but I do think that here is where the power of cloud and machine learning specifically gets really interesting because we can start to understand what normal looks like and look for the patterns of things that are not normal. And it's, you know, people go to the cloud for different reasons, but I would argue one of the, the greatest potentials that exists is around this, being able to look for anomalies, pattern anomalies in application performance behavior, network behavior, user behavior, all of those things. Big plus one on that. <laughs> so we wanted to end with, uh, and this is something that we talked about a little bit earlier, um, but we wanted to end with one of the topics that we get as many questions about as anything, and that is ransomware. Um, I think this is, you know, quickly becoming one of the more uh, troubling threats that that people have to face. Um, you know, especially smaller businesses, local governments, um, people who don't necessarily have the resources to um, have protected their systems ahead of time or to respond. Uh, you know, in in when these events occur. Um, and so, you know, I think we saw just recently, you know, in Germany, a, a poor woman died because a hospital was attacked by a ransomware attack, which disabled their systems and forced her to divert to another hospital. And, you know, I mean, if, if, if nothing else gets people to take this seriously, hopefully this will. But I'd like to ask the panel just two simple questions there. What can businesses and governments do to prevent these types of attacks from happening? And should they happen? What sh how should they respond? I guess I can start. Um, you know, we definitely uh, been in the trenches like not Patia when that happens. Uh, so the first thing I would say is, uh, for example, one of the study we showed is uh, MERSC. You know, they it, that's a public uh, information that they've been heavily attacked. Uh, 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 during a party uh, uh, incident. Um, one of the things, uh, you know, what we've done, I mean, the one thing is, I think I want to just call out for everyone is that even if we use, you know, the customers who pay the ransomware, you still have uh, the downtime of the productivity and, uh, you know, even life threatening uh, uh, events. So it's not just the answers that you just pay or the other thing is, uh, you know, you want to keep updating your, your hardware, but when this happens, it happens. And I would really go back to MERS case for example, is they went from, you know, all their on-premise like AD and that's when they, they didn't get patched and all that, but we actually really helped them to move to the cloud because the cloud is, again, that goes back to the power the cloud is, you know, it really helps them so that they are not alone. Our customer is not alone trying to see, hey, what are the different entry points of attack those uh, 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 resources uh, as well as when it's done, what's their backup and backup of backup versus when they actually move to the cloud. First of all, you know, you have that we can leverage more cloud resources for protection, but also when there are things that they need to retrieve back the copies, we also have more backup and things for them to retrieve back. Uh, so that really taking advantage of the power of the cloud and uh, MERSC is a great customer study to showcase that. Um, and the and the the second part, I think, uh, um, you know, what I, I you know I would say is, uh, you know, the you know you wanted to protect your resources. Uh, it still goes back to the principle we talked in this talk is you always want to assume breach and think about uh, what are the different uh, in depths uh, that you need to uh, uh, consider all your environment. You know, sort of for the ransomware, especially in terms of the hardware, just, uh, you know, or data centers. So that's just one vector, or so many, some of the many vectors, but uh, we really want to think about the uh, end to end in terms of from the security perspective. The ransomware is, is something that we deal with every day at Veeam because we, we actually do backup. We have a SWAT team actually that helps customers recover from it. And I would say two things. One is 
it's going to continue and it's going to get worse. In fact, there was a study that came out last week that said there was a sevenfold increase uh, this year. And I think the reason for, the, for that increase actually is because it cuts out the middleman. If you look at the money trail from 20 years ago, it was actually a very complex to go from find a vulnerability to exploit the vulnerability, to collect the data, to sell the data. It was a very complex money trail. Ransomware is basically direct from consumer to malicious individual in collecting that money. So my expectation is that we'll get a lot worse. What we can do is, is focus on the fundamentals. In, in, uh, you should expect that you're going to get breached. And so following principles of you know, three copies of your data, um, two different media types, one offsite, leverage the cloud, leverage the immutability of cloud so that you can get the data back. But back to a comment that was made earlier about zero trust, you shouldn't just expect that because your systems, you have a backup and you have a recovery plan that it's going to work. You should be testing that recovery plan on an ongoing basis. And from a zero trust perspective, one of the interesting things that we've seen with recent ransomware is that it gets in, it sits dormant for a period of time. So you recover the data and what's the first thing that happens? It encrypts everything it can. And so you should not even trust your backups when you're recovering. You should mount them and test them for dormant malware because the complexity of the, of the attacks is only going to uh, increase. But focus on the fundamentals. This, this goes back to we often don't learn from history. We don't learn from our mistakes in the past. And this just is, is a fundamental issue that we continue to deal with year after year. So br briefly, because uh, I know we're out of time, um, uh, moving, moving things to the cloud, great idea. Lots of backups, great idea. Um, for the real critical things like water purification, waste treatment, systems that open dams will never go to the cloud. And um, Danny is right. When a piece of ransomware hits as just generic malware, it doesn't know where it is. It doesn't know what it's supposed to do. And it needs to beacon out and say, I'm here. What do you want me to do? And so the beaconing, the privilege escalation attempts to try and get admin, there's going to be a lot of failed logins. There can be things like SMB scanning going on, looking for shares, looking for the good stuff to encrypt. All that creates signal. And if you're monitoring properly, you see that. And you can nip that before you know they actually pull the trigger on the encryption. Um, it doesn't just land and do its thing. It, it's got to look around. And you have an opportunity to see that. So that's where I'll leave it. Well, I think, I think that's a, a great place to stop. Uh, I want to thank uh, Michael. I want to thank Joy. I want to thank Danny for uh, a really fantastic discussion. Um, you know, it was great to get into, I think, the practical elements. Um, certainly, I know uh, Tom and I appreciate that, and I, and I believe our, our audience does um, as well. Also want to uh, thank Yubico and, and Tammy Wincup uh, and Jared for a, a great, you know, pre-discussion um, to this. And otherwise, uh, please just feel free to check out uh, protocol.com for all the best stories on the, the people, the power and the politics of tech and sign up for newsletters like Tom's uh, cloud newsletter, which uh, comes out on Thursdays. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of the day. Bye, Bye. everybody. Thank you.